All right, folks, this video is on Susan Bryson's first two chapters of her book, Aftermath, Violence, and the Remaking of a Self. This video is probably going to be fairly short since the first couple of chapters, especially the first chapter, is mostly narrative, so it should have been fairly easy to follow. But despite the fact that it is a narrative telling, Bryson does give us a kind of thesis in each of these first two chapters. And in the first chapter, Bryson argues that insight into important issues like sexual violence require an understanding of the victim's perspective, which is often excluded. But this is exactly what she offers in this text, a narrative of her perspective of her own experience of sexual assault. And further, through this narrative, through this recounting of her personal experience, she exposes victim blaming as dangerous to both those who have been victimized and to those who have not been victimized. So from the victim's perspective, Bryson is giving us a narrative account that is also philosophical in which she discusses the role of denial in experiences of rape and sexual assault. And these denials often amount to victim blaming rather than empathizing with victims of horrendous and traumatic experiences. And Bryson sees this as a social issue because we don't seem to have the vocabulary with which to express concern and empathy in situations where women and children have been victimized by sexual assault. So there's a, there's a social belief that a victim can avoid being attacked if they're more careful. And this social belief leads victims to blame themselves, which can perpetuate the trauma. Bryson explains, though, that sexual assault and rape are often random and unpredictable. And if one is a woman, it's entirely possible that she can be attacked at any time, regardless of what she's wearing, regardless of whether she's out at night, regardless of whether she's alone or not, regardless of whether she's been drinking or not, regardless of whether she enjoys sex or not. In fact, Bryson was attacked at 10 o'clock in the morning on a country road wearing jeans, a sweatshirt, and sneakers. And even she experienced victim blaming. She was told not to be stupid. So in this first chapter, Bryson argues that physical and political empowerment can help women learn to overcome powerlessness and self-blame, enabling healing and the capability to feel entitled to occupy space and to defend ourselves. Yet, the problem is that the social practices that remain in place are practices of protection, which amount to telling women not to go out after dark, especially not alone, and just to not do anything stupid. So the fear of rape and sexual violence victimizes all women, not just victims of sexual violence, but the fear of rape and sexual violence victimizes all women by restricting their freedoms, their entitlements, their happiness, and their safety. And again, Bryson wants to claim that this is a social issue. In the second chapter, she's going to argue that the personal is political. There is no separation, no dichotomy between the personal and the political. So let's go ahead and move to to chapter two. Chapter one was pretty straightforward. Again, it's primarily a narrative account. In chapter two, she begins to get a bit more philosophical, and chapter three, which we'll look at next time, becomes even more, becomes even more philosophical. So in chapter two, Bryson really attacks this long-standing tradition in philosophy, which we've already discussed in some of the epistemology readings, where knowledge is taken to be abstract and universal and not the same thing as personal experiences or feelings that are unique to particular persons. But Bryson wants to challenge this dichotomy between the personal and the political, or the personal and the philosophical. And she cites both Russell 
and Nietzsche at the beginning of the chapter to draw a contrast between these two approaches to thinking about the relationship of the personal to, to philosophical thought. And so Russell claims that knowledge is completely impersonal. It's completely abstract, universal, and this universal knowledge doesn't admit of what Russell calls the accidents of private history or knowledge gained by the senses because, as Descartes argued, the senses are unreliable. And she compares this to Nietzsche, who claims that, and I'll read it, Gradually it has become clear to me what every great philosophy so far has been, namely the personal confession of its author in a kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir. So on Nietzsche's view, he's claiming that any philosopher who has claimed that their theory, their ideas, their knowledge is impartial and not personal is fooling themselves into believing that they have the kind of subject position that Lugones discussed as being a fiction of the logics of purity. And so on Nietzsche's view then, and Bryson of course is going to agree with him, philosophy not only allows for the personal and the political, but philosophical theories and methods and knowledge itself absolutely just is personal. Any philosophical theories and ideas always bring the personal contingencies of the author, the thinker, the speaker into play. There's no such thing as a view from nowhere. And so in the second chapter, Bryson wants to argue that first-person narratives are necessary in philosophy, especially first-person narratives from those perspectives who have traditionally been excluded from speaking and from contributing and participating in the production of knowledge. And she gives three reasons in this chapter why personal narratives are not only philosophically relevant, but philosophically necessary. And the first reason is that, is that personal narratives can reveal hidden biases in both the subject matter of philosophy, that is, what it is that we talk about, and in the methodologies used. So following Virginia Held and other feminist moral theorists, Bryson argues that a feminist methodology can reveal biases in the exclusion of rape and other forms of violence against women from traditional ethical concerns and discussions. So discussions of rape and violence against women have been marginalized philosophically, not deemed as philosophically relevant or appropriate content for philosophical discussions. And so including these can also reveal the biases in not only the content of philosophical discussions, but also the methodologies used to discuss these kinds of topics. And the second reason that she believes that personal narratives are necessary in philosophy is that they can facilitate a kind of understanding of others whose views and experiences and perspectives are different from our own. And moreover, that kind of understanding can promote empathy towards others and minimize hostility, which is important in social change. And the third reason why she believes that personal narratives are necessary in philosophy is that they can allow us as philosophers to lay our biases on the table. So rather than claim that we are producing knowledge that is abstract and universal and applies to everyone everywhere, in giving personal narratives, we can acknowledge the particulars of our experiences in our lives and our identities that affect the knowledge that we're producing. And in that way, we can put our biases on the table and they can be accounted for in the production of knowledge, which is necessary and can't be done when one claims that they're producing knowledge from the perspective that is the view from nowhere. 
And this should sound familiar after reading Lugonus's Purity, Impurity, and Separation. So Bryson is arguing for the fact that we are multiple, we are particular, and we should acknowledge those particularities when we produce knowledge, rather than perpetuate these kinds of logics of purity that claim that as knowledge producers we can be epistemic subjects that are not in particular locations experiencing emotions and the contingencies of life, but rather producing pure abstract universal knowledge. Bryson does warn, however, that in giving personal narratives as a philosophical methodology, we do have to be careful and we have to understand and be clear that we're speaking only for ourselves and not for a larger group. And we have to realize that we can't always take first-person narratives and the experiences and memories from first-person narratives as foundational or necessarily true. We have to take them with a grain of salt, so to speak. And another caution is that first-person narratives can be used by others to generate counter-narratives that, that victimize people or groups of people. And similarly, they can be used to perpetuate stereotypes about a, given, uh, about a group of people. So there are some concerns about using personal narratives in philosophy, but on Bryson's view, it's absolutely necessary to bring to light social change with respect to sexual assault. And finally, she argues that there's professional risk in using personal narratives, and this is absolutely true. When one uses a personal narrative, there's always the risk of, of not being taken seriously. And Bryson testifies to this, explaining that after she wrote this book, a, a male colleague told her that she could now put that all behind her and move on and get back to real philosophy. So there is a professional risk at play because philosophy is still taken to be a kind of abstract universal practice of knowledge production that is normatively abstract and universal. That is, philosophy still practices logics of purity.